with that, I want to first uh, welcome the Attorney General, Mr. McDaniel. I appreciate it. I know he's very busy, and I appreciate his love, Mr. Cohn. And, and I think he's got a, open comments, and then we'll be available for questions. But he is on a time constraint, so if you do ask some questions, let's try to keep it brief. With yeah. that, General McDaniel, you're recognized. Right, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have with me uh, Senior Assistant Attorney General David Rout and Assistant Attorney General uh, David Curran. As you know, I have been talking in recent weeks about the legal and practical issues surrounding the death penalty in Arkansas. And although I continue to support the death penalty, I think that it is time for us to frankly discuss the system as it currently exists. And I believe that that system is completely broken. I applaud you, Mr. Chairman, for convening this committee meeting and uh, allowing us the opportunity to discuss the issues. As I see it, our options are limited. We can continue throwing money into a broken system and dedicating resources to litigation. We can modify the system, or we can abolish the death penalty altogether. Statistics from my office indicate that a killer on death row has a near 50-50 chance of receiving some kind of substantive relief from the Arkansas Supreme Court, such as another hearing or even a new trial. No other prisoner in the Department of Corrections has as many avenues of relief as death row inmates do. Arkansas currently has 37 murderers who await execution on death row. The average inmate on death row has been there for almost 15 years. Six of them have been there for more than 20 years. The AG's office has been working diligently to see that executions are carried out. But our last execution was on November the 28th, 2005. We currently have no executions scheduled. I sent letters to Governor Beebe on February the 20th of this year requesting that he set execution dates for seven inmates. The governor has not set those dates yet, and his office has said publicly the reason they have not been set is because it is not possible to conduct executions at this time. I'm sure that many of you, like me, ask the same question at this point. Why not? The focus of my testimony today will attempt to address that question. We might begin with a little brief history and background. Arkansas has had the death penalty since the 19th century. By the mid-20th century, many questions were raised about whether sentences of death were being meted out fairly. In 1970, Governor Winthrop Rockefeller, a Republican, had his own doubts about the issue. So he commuted the sentences of all 15 prisoners that were then on death row. In 1972, in Furman versus Georgia, the United States Supreme Court declared the death penalty unconstitutional across the entire country. That was based largely on the concern that judges and juries had too much unguided discretion about when to sentence a defendant to death. In 1976, the Supreme Court issued several further decisions clarifying the manner in which the death penalty could be constitutionally imposed, and executions resumed around the nation in 1977. Arkansas had, begin, had been using the electric chair, but in 1983, the General Assembly followed several other states and adopted a statute authorizing execution by lethal injection. Capital sentences were carried out by lethal injection for more than 20 years without significant challenges to the lethal injection process. However, in 2006, the United States Supreme Court, in the case of Hill versus McDonough, changed everything about death row litigation. In that case, the court said that death row inmates could file separate civil lawsuits challenging the means and methods to be used in their executions. This has led to an avalanche of civil lawsuits in state and federal courts around the nation. It's important to know that civil litigation today stands as a much greater impediment to executions than the appeals process, even though the appeals process for criminals uh, on death row uh, is itself significant and lengthy. Thus, even after an inmate has litigated his criminal appeals and post-conviction challenges to the extent available for 20 years or more, he may still file an entirely new round of civil litigation challenging the methods of his sentence, the methods of his execution and how his sentence would be carried out. In many states, the implementation of the death penalty has ground to a halt due to these lawsuits. 
Notably, in Arkansas, the Supreme Court has granted stays of execution to allow inmates to challenge the lethal injection process in civil suits, even though every as aspect of their convictions and sentences have already been upheld. As a result, as I said, no executions have taken place since 2005. Since Hill v. McDonough has, was handed down in 2006, Arkansas inmates have filed numerous suits challenging various aspects of the lethal injection process. In one of those cases, the inmate contended that the Department of Corrections should have engaged in rulemaking uh, under the Administrative Procedures Act when they specified the means and methods for carrying out the injection. In order to cut short that argument, as well as to address the shortage of drugs for lethal injection, which the ADC had already foreseen, the General Assembly amended the lethal injection law in 2009. It was, of course, promptly challenged in court by several inmates. And even though Arkansas statute was the same as those in several other states, our Supreme Court ruled that it violated the separation of powers doctrine by giving too much discretion to the Department of Corrections. In 2013, Senator Hester and Representative Steele introduced a new lethal injection statute which gave more specific guidance to the ADC. It should be no surprise to any of us, though, that the new law, only enacted in March, is already being challenged in court. The suit alleges that the statute must specify the type of IV procedures used and the rate of flow through the syringe. I believe that if the legislature were to amend the law today, I believe that if the legislature were to amend the law today to give inmates what they contend is required, they would file yet another suit tomorrow, challenging yet another aspect of the medical procedure. I truly believe that the statute could be as long and detailed as war and peace, and we would still get sued. In addition to the lengthy criminal appeals and never-ending civil litigation, there is also a new practical impediment. The drugs needed for lethal injection are simply not available for the state to purchase anymore. Let me repeat that. The drugs needed for lethal injection are simply not available for purchase for the state. There are really only two drugs, thiopental and pentobarbital, that have been approved by both the medical community and the courts for the execution of a human being. These drugs are not available for purchase by state departments of corrections currently. Many of the manufacturers of the drugs are European. The death penalty has been abolished in most of Europe and those manufacturers will not sell their drugs to us for that purpose. I have been asked by the public and the press, and in fact many of you, about Texas. And it has been pointed out that Texas carried out an execution by lethal injection as recently as this month. Texas, as did some other states, or as do some other states, have some old supplies that are still available for use in their prison pharmacies but even their supplies are dwindling. We don't know specifically what Texas has on hand, but one recent public record search indicates they have enough for 23 executions. However, even those 23 doses have an expiration date, and we don't know when those dates will arrive uh, and when those drugs will be no longer available for use. The universal lack of availability is why the old practice of sharing or buying drugs from other states no longer takes place. It's important for you to know that Texas is not the only state that attempted to plan ahead. We did too. Arkansas attempted to acquire an ample supply of lethal injection drugs for future use, envisioning this very problem. However, the federal government, the DEA, the United States Attorney, in 2011 informed the state that they believe the drugs were improperly imported and threatened seizure of the drugs. And ultimately, after lengthy discussions back and forth, the state turned the drugs over to the federal government, and no viable source of replacement has been found. The federal government is currently blocking the importation of any drug for the use in lethal injections. Just yesterday, it was on the front page of the Arkansas section today, I think, maybe the front page of the paper. In Cook versus FDA, the U.S. Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. ruled that the FDA cannot allow lethal injection drugs to be imported from foreign manufacturers or pharmacies. In addition to the drug shortage issue, 
There's a personnel issue. The state must have someone qualified and willing to administer a lethal injection. <clears throat> Medical professionals have participated in the past so long as they could do so anonymously. Now, as an additional line of attack on the system, inmates have begun demanding the names and qualifications of those who set the IV lines and administer the drugs. It is much more difficult to find medical professionals willing to participate if they face lawsuits challenging their abilities, their motives, their qualifications, their personal and professional backgrounds. Furthermore, some inmate lawsuits have contended that only a doctor, only a physician can administer the lethal injection, and others insist that a doctor must write a prescription for the drugs to be administered. And of course, the inmates know that the, medical, the American Medical Association has taken the position that it is unethical for a physician to participate in the execution of an otherwise healthy human being. As states are beginning to realize lethal injections are all but impossible to carry out as a result of the practical and legal hurdles I have described, and I assure you there are more that I have not mentioned for the sake of brevity, they are therefore engaging in a discussion looking for alternative methods of execution. Within the last three years, the state of Utah executed a man by firing squad. The Attorney General of Missouri earlier this month said that Missouri might have to reopen their gas chamber if their efforts to carry out lethal injections continue to be halted. The Arkansas statute says that if lethal injection becomes unavailable as a method or becomes invalidated, our fallback method of execution is still the electric chair. Of course, we don't know for sure how the courts would view an execution by firing squad or gas chamber or electric chair, but I think I have a pretty good guess. Although the specific factual issues in a challenge to execution by one of those alternative methods would be different, the legal issues regarding claims of cruelty and the possibility of undue pain or mistake would be exactly the same as the claims raised in the lethal injection cases. I want you to know that I will do everything in my power until I leave office to address the death penalty's legal hurdles, but I cannot tell you how this chapter is going to play out. I thank you for taking the time to discuss this important issue and direct your attention to it. As the policymakers of this state and as my clients, I stand ready to assist you in any way that I can, and I'm eager to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, uh, General Daniel. <clears throat> One question, Hill, Madonna, is that a U.S. Supreme Court or? Yes, sir. Would that, did they rule that that was part of their due process rights to be able to file civil claims or? They did. The question was whether or not their civil claims had to be raised earlier in their habeas corpus proceedings. And the fact that they didn't uh, include their claims in the, in the earlier habeas proceedings should have barred them from being raised in a subsequent civil action at the last hour. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, uh, you have uh, a right to raise these claims, and if uh, you don't raise them, and if you prove later to have been right, the irreparable harm is that you're dead. And so, um, as with all legal approaches to the death penalty, this is different than other cases. Uh, the other methods, and you're right. You're By the way, I looked at these guys to nod their heads and tell me that I didn't just tell you something wrong. And they're scared to tell me, oh no, that's wrong, but tell me if I said something wrong. Uh, so, since you're me in some sort of subtle way. <laughs> so you're saying that there's nothing, if it's a fundamental constitutional right. There's nothing that we as a state can do to change the access to the court and the filing of these civil lawsuits. The other methods of uh, execution, while there will always be challenges, has the Supreme Court ruled that electrocution or the firing squad or what have you is a valid form of execution? So have those been addressed by the U.S. Supreme Court? I do not believe that they have been ruled unconstitutional per se. Uh, the question is going to be, and actually, Mr. Curran can address this, but as we were doing some research, the litigation surrounding hanging, for instance, is just as meticulous and picky and 
uh, deliberate, I don't mean to be to, to mischaracterize the nature of the litigation, uh, as it would be, and as it is, on lethal injection. Uh, how the gallows must be constructed. If the fall is too short, then the condemned uh, doesn't die quickly. If the fall is too long, the condemned uh, can suffer decapitation. If the, if the rope is not thick or sturdy enough, you know, all of the complications. And so I don't care what method a state determines they're going to kill a person with. The litigation, the nature of the litigation will be essentially the same. What could go wrong? Why should you do it that way? How do you know that this particular process is, is appropriate? Oh, judge, we need relief because of A, B, C, and D. Do you want to add anything to that? I would, I would just add one, one other point is under the Eighth Amendment, the courts uh, apply what is known as the evolving standards of decency. And so what they often do is they look and sort of survey the landscape and see what states are doing. And so um, in future litigation, if the method of execution would change, that would be an issue uh, is whether you can go back to something like the electric chair. That would be a, a litigation issue. All right, and I alluded to that in my testimony of what a court would think, and, I, and I've said this publicly. I do believe that most Arkansans still support the death penalty, but I also think that the evolving standards uh, would cause people to question whether or not they would be comfortable. Uh, you know, where, where's the line of decency? What, what method is too gruesome or violent? Those would all be questions that, that could be litigated. And last question I have, and see if Williams has a question after that, but in regards to the physicians who are subject to their credentials being challenged, and is, we could, I believe, uh, statutorily, and I think we have, limited discovery in med mal cases and, and made some items non-discoverable. Is, is it, are we prohibited from doing that because the inmates' fundamental due process rights, or could we statutorily? I know you're asking I think, I think that, that, well, first of all, I'll defend any act that is passed by the General Assembly. But I think, as we have seen uh, repeatedly from the Arkansas Supreme Court, they guard jealously their ability to uh, govern their courts. and we, the legislature attempts to pass rules of, of evidence of what is and isn't discoverable. I know, and, it's, it's and I will also point out that Georgia has just recently, uh, their, their statute was to guard the anonymity, right? And the drug supplier. And uh, absolutely confidential, cannot be disclosed, not to the public, not to the press, not to the condemned, not to anybody. And, the, and it was a, was a federal court of the Georgia Supreme Court. All right. Well, the Georgia trial court, I guess, just last week said uh, that was uh, overstepping by the Georgia General Assembly. That couldn't be done. Was that based on separation of power, or was that based on the violation of? The I would think that it'd be both due process and separation of powers. But I, I truthfully would have to defer to David on the details of that Georgia trial court's opinion. To be clear, I would defend any effort to preserve the anonymity of anyone who is assisting the Department of Corrections in this process. Gerald, it's always good to see you. Thank you for being here. Always good to see you, good friend. Thank Are there sir. any um, any other methods used? I mean, there are lots of ways to execute somebody, but anything uh, not gruesome that hasn't been mentioned.
and you kind of, well, you've got a problem, you've got to solve it. We found that that's pretty difficult to do that in this So from a legal standpoint, I would hope and ask, and if you'd like some feedback today on some pretty high-level things that you think we should do to move us forward. We know what we want to do, but we still have a law that says uh, this is your process. Now, the process is fouled up, and you've you know, verified that. So help us understand what we need to do to right this ship to continue uh, with the capital punishment. You know, when somebody's running for president, they're, you know, having to say, sits them in a room and they say, you're going to get the question, why do you want to be president? You've got to be able to answer the question. And I knew the question today is, okay, so what do we do about it? And I have stewed and stewed on what to tell you in response to the question that I knew was coming. We are all people of action, or we wouldn't have run for public office. None of us. I, I know all of you personally at one level or another, and there's no one in this room that is comfortable with seeing a problem and being told there's no answer to it. There are very few options. One thing that could be done is to attempt to apply pressure to our federal delegation to have Congress change the law that prohibits the FDA uh, from allowing importation. The, the law that was uh, interpreted by the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals yesterday. Um, the FDA can't do it because Congress doesn't allow it, but Congress could change what the FDA is allowed to do. There are manufacturers around the world who manufacture this drug who would be more than willing to sell it to us. Would that solve our problem? No, it would not solve our problem, but it would be one. It would be one step in the right direction. At least, at, I mean, at least at some point, it would put supplies into the medicine cabinet down at the Department of Corrections, so that if we can resolve the other issues, we at least had uh, the drugs to uh, put into the syringe, which at this point we don't. Well, of course, before yesterday, this wasn't an issue. Importation, right? I mean, that, that wasn't. Yes, it was. That was the that was the primary reason that the DEA came and seized our drugs in 2011. I said that we did not have proper legal authority to import them from the United Kingdom, and we were not the only uh, state, by the way, that that was met with those demands by the federal government. So, take me one step beyond. We the, the drugs now can be imported. Let's assume for a minute. We still have a system that's that's unworkable. So tell me what would be the next step that we would need to do to right this ship again. Well, in the meantime, because obviously we know that Congress doesn't act quickly, especially on substantial pieces of legislation like that. Uh, and so in the meantime, we would be working on the litigation side of things. The courts, we learn something from the courts each time we litigate, you know, what they want, what they ex ex expect. So we would continue litigating, for instance, the challenge to the 2013 Act. Uh, we would continue trying to address personnel issues and protocols through the Department of Corrections. They have extraordinarily hardworking staff. I know they're here and will be answering your questions after I uh, leave. And I applaud them for uh, continuing to look at very complex, complicated problems and trying to find ways to resolve them. So there's a way that some state has found to uh, simplify or secure uh, personnel issues. We would emulate that. There are a lot of tracks you know, that are having to be uh, uh, marched along in this process and we would do them all simultaneously. I'm not sure that gives us some marching order. I know I asked for a high level, but I'm still, um, even before the 13th session, when we thought we were correcting the issue with the Bart Hester and Steele's piece of legislation, which I know you you guys were in, mean, you basically wrote it, that that didn't solve our problem? Well, we told I'm you that. Drug, I understand not having the actual drugs. I understand that it's sure. something maybe beyond our control. But that process that we thought we were correcting, we didn't correct. 
Well, it's not that simple. As, as I can't remember if that went through your committee or judiciary. I think it went through judiciary. Went through this. Um, and um, as I remember saying to you at the time, this, the law that we passed in 09 was, by all estimates and accounts, constitutional. It mirrored the law in five other states that had been vetted by their Supreme Courts and held to be constitutional. So I respectfully disagreed with the fact that the Arkansas Supreme Court took the minority view among other states and said it was not constitutional. Furthermore, they said in their opinion that they specifically weren't going to tell us what was needed to be done in order to make it constitutional. So it was quite a challenge for all of us. Uh, there was something wrong with it, but they wouldn't exactly tell us what was wrong with it, so we had to just guess. And so we did everything that we could to address what we believed to be the problems. And when we presented it in committee, and I personally came to present it in both committees, said, we are doing the best that we can to address the court's concerns. The only thing I can guarantee, I cannot guarantee you that the court will uphold this. The only thing I can guarantee you is that we're going to get our chance to find out because we will be sued almost the day that this becomes law. And there will be more challenges. So, so it, did we correct it? Yes. But did the prediction that we'll continue to have litigation come true? Yes. And what I told you today is I don't, you know, if the governor called a special session tomorrow and we tried to address everything in the lawsuit, there'd still be another lawsuit after that. I guess, and I, this was my last question, I guess what we're saying is we put a solution in place with my understanding that this is in such disarray we can't work within our framework, but yet we we will the law implemented. It hadn't been tested in the courts yet, but we still think we're in such disarray that uh, there's no hope for the system unless we completely redo it. Well, I don't know that I don't know that I would necessarily characterize it that way. What I've said is that there are multiple problems that are very complex with very few, well, no simple answers and very few, if any, mm -hmm. complicated answers. We're going to have to keep litigating challenges to the law. We're going to have to keep litigating the civil challenges to the procedures. This was handed down by the United States Supreme Court, and every state legislature in the nation that has the death penalty is having the same level of frustration that you are right now. If there was a simple answer, somebody would have found it by now. And if, 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 if another if Georgia had the answer, or if Texas had the answer, or Alabama, or Arkansas, or Oklahoma, if anybody had the answer, we would all share it with one another and we'd move on. It's not out there. Thank you. Yes, sir. I think I know you share the same concern, Chairman Daniel. It's a lawyer, obviously. My biggest concern is that we have juries who are rendering verdicts that we are not fulfilling and that that strikes at the very core and the uh, trustworthiness of our entire criminal justice system um, so I, I think it's I know you are doing your part I think it's certainly imperative as long as this is on the books and as long as the juries are rendering um, capital punishment we we were obligated as legislators and attorney general to do everything we can to see that it's carried out. Uh, so that, that brings me to Utah. I think you said you use a firing squad. That had to be challenged. It was a challenge. Nobody challenged it. It was an old statute that, at the time that inmate was sentenced, that said that the, the method of, it, of execution would be firing squad. Since that time, uh, they passed a statute that said it would be lethal injection or firing squad at the election of the condemned. And I think now it's just lethal injection and firing squad is no longer an option, I think, in Utah. And, but when the time came for his execution, uh, he didn't elect for, uh, he elected, he chose uh, firing squad and he didn't file any challenges to it. Uh, if I may address the point that you just made, because you and I have discussed this privately, and I think it's an extremely important point. We had, a, in my part of the state, Poinsett County, we had uh, a police officer in Truman 
viciously and cowardly murdered in the line of duty, all on video. And within hours of the shooting, I was there with the chief and the prosecuting attorney and that officer's family and watched that video and it was horrific. And his murderer was sentenced to death. And all of these, and that was a year ago, and these issues were still evolving at the time. Even my grasp of just how many issues really are at play here has only come together in the last year or so. And I think we, at this point, have to open this conversation to prosecuting attorneys, victims advocates, and be honest with jurors and, 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 uh, and victims that you know, we're asking the jury to do something that the state is simply not capable of doing. We're spending an awful lot of time and effort and resources to secure death penalty sentences. And at some point, we have to acknowledge that we can't carry them out. You know, I, when the chief of police, the assistant chief of police in Plummerville, Arkansas, in Conway County, was killed in the line of duty, his son, who was a deputy sheriff, was the first on the scene of his own father's murder. And Josh asked me to, to, to uh, speak at his father's funeral, which I proudly did. And as the family was considering whether or not they should ask the prosecuting attorney to seek the death penalty, we talked quite a bit. And I told him if it was my father who was killed that way, I'd want his killer executed. As a police officer, if we're going to have the death penalty, many of you know, most of you, I guess, know that I was a police officer before I went to law school. Um, if we're going to have a death penalty, it certainly should be applied when an officer is killed in the line of duty. So I'd want the death penalty for a cop killer. But as Attorney General, I know something about what the family of the victim will experience. If the killer is given life without parole, that family knows at that point that that man will never draw another breath outside of prison for the rest of his life. And there's some closure, there's some finality. If he's given the death penalty, the family would spend the next 20 years waiting for that sentence to be carried out, dreading every time the phone rang because it's someone else from the state calling to update them about yet another hearing and yet another pleading and yet another filing and yet another date, more and more opportunities to sit in the room with his father's killer and listen to judge after judge have to grant the motions that are filed by that person. I think that there are witnesses that will testify later today about what families of the victims experience. And I think that one member of this committee uh, was quoted in the paper saying just how terrible this circumstance is on the families of the victims. And I just it's one more consequence to the broken system that we should take into consideration, which is the families of those who were killed. So I appreciate you raising that point. Well, I, I, I certainly agree with that. that it, it, uh, people need to be aware of the uh, problem tail in seeking capital punishment. But I, I, if it is sought and it is rendered, uh, I understand if we can, we can. I guess I'm just not ready to, I know you're not either, you're going to continue litigate. But uh, so the electric chair. It's being done in other states. Is that correct? I, I don't know. All right, I, guess. I don't know why he can't just tell you, but he told me some other stuff. The um, uh, Nebraska attempted to re-implement, as I understand it, the uh, uh, electric chair, and uh, recently in the last couple of years and, and Nebraska's Supreme Court struck it down as being unconstitutional per se. To my knowledge, no jurisdiction is currently using the electric chair. Sorry, I said you said the gas chamber, George Anger. What I'm getting at is there been no litigation, no challenge to these other methodologies. 
I don't think anyone's been using them. Everyone's gone since the early 80s to lethal injection, and all of the litigation has been around can we continue to use lethal injection or not. And you know, part of the um, part of the policy considerations around lethal injection is that you know, to the extent that you're going to take another person's life, it's as humane as a, a method as as available is, is available. And so, if we can't defend that, obviously states would see even more complicated questions about. We haven't lost on the methods. The humaneness of. I mean, that's never been. It has not been ruled unconstitutional per se. No. Uh, and so I guess when they were using the electric chair, did nobody ever challenge the humaneness of the electric chair to the Supreme Court? I'm sure they did, and that was I'm, I'm sure all part of the, uh, the the justification of why the courts, the U.S. Supreme Court, abolished the death penalty as a national policy to begin with. But, but they reinstated it. They reinstated executions. Four years later, yes. Okay, I'm trying to narrow. It may not be possible, but I'm trying to narrow. By the way, you remember that signal that you and I worked out last time from years ago? You may not be able to see it, but I've been doing it for a while. Okay, and that's all my questions. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think Chairman Wright, I'll get it set. I forgot to tell him the signal. I'll be brief, and then I can ask the staff if you need to go, General. No, no, I'm just teasing, Mr. Chairman. Has anybody looked into the additional costs the state incurs by way of the many things you know that has to be done, additional juror time, there's a, a fine public defender sitting behind you that, that has to hire uh, staff to defend these things. And, and has anybody, are you aware, looked into any of that? I think there have been a lot of studies about cost. To be brutally honest, cost is not my concern. That's the General Assembly's concern. Uh, that's the public's concern. As far as I'm concerned, the public policy of this state is we are willing to pay more to see this sentence carried out because in limited circumstances it is, it is the appropriate thing to do. And so if the public is... And I think that that's fine. If the court wants to pay more for extra public defenders and... and and for prosecutors who are death penalty qualified, and jurors who are death penalty qualified, and judges that have to go to death penalty school before they can hear one of the cases, and, and the entire uh, workings of the uh, Attorney General's office uh, to handle the uh, litigation for years, and all of the Department of Correction costs that surround dealing with a, a death row inmate, if the public policy of the state is we're willing to do that because we eventually want to see that person executed, then that's fine. I think the, the alarm that I've been sounding is would you still spend all that money if you knew that he was never going to get executed? And it, you know, so that's a whole different policy question. Thank you, General. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate very much this committee, and obviously if you have additional questions for us or my staff, as you know, we are available to you individually. Uh, I assume that every person in this room has my cell phone, and I encourage you to call me if you want to ask me something, and certainly if you need us to come back. Uh, as you know, we, we are at your service, and I was only teasing if you need me here until the end of the day, I promise I'll come. I'm always Let's say questions to the department.